Madam Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to join this debate. I'd like to tell you about the events I experienced one Saturday in July 2015. Six months ago, I was at the Padang, as I had the privilege to be the reserve commander for the PCF marching contingent uh, of the NDP. Just in front of me and to my left were three young men, soldiers, also on reserve duty, ready to go out on the parade square if needed. Their uniforms were white and starched, their boots shined to a mirror finish, the brass all buffed and polished. I was reminded of my three sons, especially as these three in front of me were engaged in the very familiar mix of bravado and aggression and camaraderie that seems to strike any group of young men when they're away from the influence of their mothers and girlfriends and wives. They were joking and poking and pushing and shoving, enjoying each other's company. Then the music started. The first few bars of Majula Singapura. We all turned to face the flag that we could not see. Ahead and above us and around us were the stands full of people who could not see us. We began to sing. We began to sing as we had done many times before. But something was, something was different on that afternoon. Maybe it was the excitement of the dress rehearsal. <clears throat> Excuse me. But maybe it was just a sense of whimsy or foolishness on the part of one of those soldiers. But these three young men, these three young soldiers on my left, started to sing as loud as they could pouring all their energy, not shouting, but putting every ounce of effort into singing, using every fiber of their being. You could hear all the passion and pride that they could muster. Maybe they were egging each other on. Maybe they thought they would try and drown out the thousands of spectators that they couldn't see. Whatever the reason, the aunties and uncles around me, I'll include myself in that, we wouldn't be left behind. We also raised our voices louder and louder and louder. And although I, you know, I couldn't turn around to check, in my mind's eye, the inchecks behind us were also singing louder and louder and louder. If you've ever sung in a choir, there's a special feel in the air when everyone gets it right, when the timing is just perfect with everybody in step. It's the same feeling you get if you're rowing a boat, paddling a dragon boat, and suddenly every oar stroke falls into perfect time. The boat surges forward. The choir lifts their voices a little bit more not because of any effort, because everybody has fallen into step perfectly. The moment doesn't last long, but it feels, it feels special, almost magical. And so louder and louder we sang until it was a roar, a roar full of pride, a roar full of passion, unseen, perhaps unheard. When the last notes faded away, we all fell silent, we looked around, smiled, we acknowledged with that combination of joy and awkwardness that you get when you share a public experience with strangers. But we all agreed we had felt something special that afternoon. And when I left the Padang later that evening, I had an extra spring in my step, a song in my heart. I was rushing back to my constituency to join the Pungul Damai Residence Committee for an SG50 celebration. They had worked very hard for many weeks, decorating their estate, building a little kampong, putting up flags everywhere, some big, some small. It was a great event, a huge event, several hundred families having a great time. The night starting to come to an end. We were in the multi-purpose hall in the, in the HDB estate singing. I found myself standing on the floor in front of the stage. It was in the last event, the stage was filled with kids. The last song, of course, was going to be Majula Singapura. And so as the committee was getting ready to play the music, I turned around and I found this small boy just, just on the stage behind me with his head just behind my ear. I said, we're going to sing Majula Singapura. Are you going to sing? I asked him. He said, yes, uncle, yes, uncle. He says, do you know the words? I said, yes, yes, uncle, I know all the words, he replied. And he was full of excitement, full of energy. We began to sing. He did not know the words. Not at all. You could vaguely make out a tune, but that was about it. But even worse, he didn't know the timing. So as the first verse finished with Burjaya Singapura, and there's that pause, into the short silence between the verses, you could hear this young voice with all his energy and gusto, trying to sing and trying loudly to sing, but you couldn't really hear the words that he was singing. Completely out of time. And his parents were on the front row of the seats facing me, and they began to have a very worried look on their face, looking like they wanted to do something or fix something. I smiled at them and shrugged, you know, it was okay, he was trying his best, he was doing his best, everything was okay. As a little child, trying his best to sing our Majula Singapura. We all smiled, we all sang, and throughout the song, we heard his little voice trying harder and harder and harder to get it right. Maybe he thought if he sang a little bit louder, all the aunties and uncles would finally follow him. <laughs> we also sang louder and louder. And when we finished, we all laughed, we high-fived, we hugged. 
And on my way back home, I was thinking about the two versions of this song. One in perfect time, synchronicity. One completely out of time, chaotic. But all sung with passion and pride, celebrating our national day. I have told the story many times to family, to friends, to my students, to my residents. And after a while, I began to think about how people would respond to the story, how they were responding to my story as I watched them. Their expressions, their emotions, what they said. And in particular, I wondered about what questions I might, ask, might be asked when someone heard my story. And there was one question that occurred to me, one particular question that would be very natural in many parts of the world if you heard this story. Maybe it would have been natural to ask this question 50 years ago in Singapore. Maybe 10 years ago, maybe five years ago. I began to look out for the story, telling the question deliberately, waiting to see if someone was going to ask me. Watching and waiting. I was never asked this question. In the Singapore of today, in the six months that I've been telling the story and boring my grassroots leaders with it, I have never, ever once been asked about the race of these boys. The soldiers, the little boy, I have never been asked what race they were. What does that say about the Singapore of today? That when I tell a story like this, it doesn't occur to anyone to ask because it doesn't change the story. The stories about Singapore and Singaporeans, regardless of race, language, or religion. 